good. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm a little behind, but oh. it's fine. That's what I get for not really doing much work for like four days in a row. What do you mean? We've been doing work. Uh, I haven't been doing work oh. personally, oh, okay. like my homework for school or whatever, or studying. Oh. So tonight I have to write two tests and then I have a bunch of homework to catch up on, but you know, my fault, my problem. Yeah. Um, How's your cat now? Getting king of the cone? Still in a cone, and he'll be in a cone for another like two weeks. No. Uh, one week from now, I get to take him back to the vet so that they can remove the staples from his stomach. Oh my god. Uh, and then after one week more, then he can start walking around without the cone, but um, he's yeah. fine. He's just, I don't know, restless because he's stuck in his little cage all day. Yeah. Are you giving him medicine or he doesn't need to take it? Uh, he had painkillers for the first few days, but we're all out of painkillers, and now it's just antibiotics. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, again, yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh-huh. Um. Let me get my dinner. I am mostly just glad that I had pet insurance, because instead oh, yeah. of paying the full amount, it's only the, uh, copay, which is 250 plus 10% of the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, which the whole point in getting insurance on them when they were pets was in the event that they needed surgery. So I'm really glad I made that bet. Um, if y'all yeah. out there get your own pets, boy, do I recommend buying health insurance for them. It's yeah. like 20 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's worth like, it. Or else it would have been like, you know, I don't know. 10, yeah, if you, if you use it even like once during your pet's lifetime, it'll be worth all of those monthly payments, like a thousand bucks every four or five years, mm -hmm. probably two or three thousand over the life of your pet. So if there's even like one time that you use it and it saves you more than two or three thousand dollars, totally worth it. Oh yeah. Um, again, this isn't an advertisement, so I won't tell you what company to go with, but um, still worth looking into pet health insurance if you're going to get a mammalian pet. Mm -hmm. Um. Very true. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back to the old AP physics grindstone. And yesterday we were talking about conservation laws, but instead of you know breaking up stuff the way that we have before, I'm trying to make some new connections here. And so instead of teaching these two things as if they were separate, I just toss them together. Uh, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum are both various conservation laws. One of them is the conservation of a scalar that is present within mechanics. The other one is the conservation of a vector, which is conserved within mechanics. Energy is our conserved scalar. Momentum is our conserved vector. And with th those two things combined, we can actually do every single kind of mechanical problem that we can do with Newton's laws and kinematics. They will always produce the same answer. It's just that depending on the question and the context, Maybe using these conservation laws might make a problem easier, or in the case of where we use momentum, it might make the problem possible. Um, item number one. We showed yesterday that this question is doable by regular old mechanics. We added up the forces, we said F equals MA, and then once we had A, we did the kinematics and we got an answer for the final velocity. Uh, if you have your warm-up out in front of you now, what was that final velocity that we calculated yesterday? 5.43 meters per second. Yeah. yeah. So you should know that you should get V is equal to 5.43 meters per second here for question number one, even before you begin. But the point is, I want to show that we can get the exact same thing here by using the work energy theorem. So go ahead, do that, solve for the final velocity and show that it is still this. And then over here on the right, this is a more involved question. This one has no numbers in it. It's all in terms of variables. Uh, let's go ahead and say that for the second question, and it is relevant, we're on Earth, but we'll just call gravity, you know, G, and it points downwards. So I have a block sitting at the bottom of some ramp. A bullet is shot towards it. The bullet has a mass of lowercase m and a velocity of lowercase v. Whereas this block that it's going to hit has a uh, mass of capital M and a velocity, an initial velocity of zero. 
So the bullet is going to hit the block and become embedded in it. And then together with whatever velocity it has, it is then going to be carried up that hill. So my question is, how high up this ramp is it going to be pushed based on the impact with this bullet? Now, this is a good question because it uses both of our conservation laws. So to figure out like what equations we are going to set up and why, let's go ahead and talk about like which, what types of events are occurring that is going to tell us which conservation laws to use where. So one thing hits and sticks with another. What is that event called in mechanics? That is an inelastic collision where what is conserved? Momentum. So right here, we're gonna have an inelastic collision, that's event one, where P is conserved. So this will tell us what the velocity of the two object system is moving to the right. And then after the inelastic collision, what kind of conservation is going to tell us uh, how high it goes up the hill? What kind of energy does a moving object have? Kinetic. So once this collides, then the two body Better. system will have kinetic energy. And then it's gonna go up this hill until all of that kinetic energy has become what? Potential. Potential energy. Potential energy. So after the inelastic collision, we'll have some information about the momentum of the system. Take this and solve it for V. After you have that, then we're gonna set up a conservation of energy equation. Where energy is conserved. I'm gonna go ahead and say mechanical energy specifically is conserved. And this statement of mechanical energy conservation will allow us to take a kinetic energy and turn it into a potential energy. And this potential energy, because it's potential energy stored against gravity, this will have the H in it that we can solve for. So with any single like mechanics question, always break it up into events. Think about what kind of events they are and see what kinds of physical theories apply to those events. This is a daunting question if you take it on all at once, but it's actually two questions put together. One, we have a collision. And then two, after that collision, it's just one object moving with kinetic energy. How much kinetic energy, I'm sorry, based on the amount of kinetic energy it has, how high can it go up this hill as that kinetic energy is transformed into potential energy. Also, check this out. Man, I, this clothing website I like, which again, I won't mention the brand because I don't want to do advertising for people. Uh, but a clothing brand that I like a lot has Pokemon medical masks. What? <laughs> it's really good. Oh, and it's like a high quality mask. Like it's got the piece of wire to hold down the thing over your nose so that you can wear it with sunglasses so that it's steaming up the sunglasses. Mm -hmm. uh, medical masses steaming up my sunglasses has been one of my most hated things during this quarantine. So annoying. Uh, other thing, bearded guys, uh, you guys know that if you have a beard, it makes wearing a medical mask less effective and in some cases like pointless, right? Oh. <laughs> it, yeah, have you heard about this? I yeah. Know. Yeah, basically if you have a beard, it's going to have hair here and here and it's going to push up the medical mask, creating a gap on the sides. If you're just oh. wearing this type of cloth mask, it probably doesn't matter because this is only providing partial protection anyway. So having a beard underneath it will decrease the amount of partial protection you're being provided. But if you're bothering to go so far as to get N95 masks, yeah, wearing an N95 mask with a beard is pretty dumb. That's a, that's a pretty big waste of time. Um, that's, that's like putting all of the money into a video card and then connecting it to a monitor from like 1997. Like, I see where you spent the money, but without this other part, agreeing with this first part, it was really a waste of money. Oh. All right. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get going here. And um, <clears throat> as we go along through this, I'm going to be really clear with the like voiceover, just because, um, I don't know, when you start out, physics is really hard to get because it's a bunch of just like math and symbols, and it's hard to tell why what is being said equal to what. 
which is why I've been focusing on these tutorials to help instill the correct inner monologue inside of you when it comes to thinking about a physics. Uh, item number one, we were asked to specifically use the work energy theorem in order to answer the question from yesterday. And um, I guess let's just go ahead and start off with what the work energy theorem is. What is the work energy theorem? What does that mean? What is work? Um, force times distance. So work is equal to force multiplied by the distance over which that force is applied. Mm -hmm. And because of the existence of torque, we have to be really careful when we talk about this force. If this is my direction of movement, right, and I apply a force on it, if I apply that force perpendicular and hold this elbow here constant, as I apply the force, it's going to cause a rotation. This is not doing work technically. It could never because the force is perpendicular to the direction of travel. Please keep in mind that for work to actually be work, it has to be a force which is parallel to the direction of motion. Or on your AP equation sheet, they'll also call this F cosine theta because when they write the AP test up, they always phrase the angle such that the part doing work will be the cosine component of the vector. And what does work change? So we apply an external force and work is gonna change what in a system? Kinetic energy. So this force that we're gonna apply on the system is going to drive a change in the kinetic energy. And since this guy is starting for rest, or from rest, what, what is kinetic energy's formulation? 1 half mv squared? Yeah, it's 1 half mv squared. So force parallel times the distance over which that force is applied is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is going to be kinetic energy final, which I'll just call kinetic energy 1, minus kinetic energy 0. Normally in physics or whatever science, a subscript of 0 just means that this is what the value was when time was 0, when the problem started. And because our initial velocity here, v sub zero, is zero meters per second, one half mv squared is one half zero squared, which is, of course, zero. So if we're increasing up from zero, then the change in energy is going to be equal to, well, the total amount of energy. So now let's go ahead and calculate the work. Now, we know that we're moving left and right, so we need to figure out, well, what forces are acting left and which forces are acting right? So what force is acting right? What force is going to be doing positive work for us? Kinetic energy. Okay. Uh, kinetic energy is not a force. It's uh, the energy of movement. So of the forces that are here, what component of force acts to the right? Cosine. Of? Um, mg cosine theta. 30 degrees. So 30, no? the external force that's being applied here is 7. Now, the reason why we're not going to just write down seven is the fact that is seven acting parallel to our direction of motion? No. No. No, it is not. Part of it is because it's not, you know, perpendicular to our direction of motion. Some of this seven Newton force is acting to the right, so it has a component that goes that way. But what about the rest of it? Seven down. Yeah, it's also going to have this component which acts down. Keep in mind that when we have a diagonal vector, the two components would be basically the side lengths of a right triangle. Uh, and so this is our 30 degree angle. And so it's inside of this parallelogram that we're looking at right here. So if we wanna know, well, what part of it is doing the work? Which part of it is acting to the right? From this 30 degree component here, it's gonna be the adjacent side. So seven Newtons times cosine of 30, that's doing positive work. Are there any other forces acting left and right here? Yeah, friction. Friction is acting to the left. So we would say that it's doing negative work. So I'm going to subtract this from the force. And you technically, you should say F delta X minus F delta X. But since both of these forces are acting over a five meter distance, I'm just going to pretend that I factored out the delta X, right? So since they both get multiplied by the same delta x, it doesn't matter whether or not we add up the forces and multiply or multiply and then add up the energies, it's gonna be the same final digit. So this is the force driving us forward. So from this, I'll have to subtract friction, which is going to be mu times the normal force. So that's gonna be equal to 0 0.01 uh, 
uh, that's mu, times the normal force, which is going to be equal to mg, uh, 2 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared, plus what extra piece of normal force is going to be here? So is it bigger because it's getting pushed down? Exactly. If you like have a thing on a table, right? So right now, uh, my little whiteout strip here has a normal force equal to its weight coming back from the table. But if I push down on it and this isn't smashing it through the table, then to cancel out the extra force coming from my finger, the table also has to respond with extra force acting upwards. So the normal force here isn't just the weight. The table needs to support the mg coming from this along with this little extra component coming off of the seven newton force. So it's gonna be the weight plus seven newtons sine 30. So let's see, it'll be closed parenthesis and then big closed parenthesis. So in terms of this equation, all of this is just the force, just the force. Uh, and what do we have to multiply the force by in order to get work? Distance. We have to take this and multiply it by the distance, which we set up top is five meters. Mm -hmm. And this work, this huge force statement, which of course is the force driving us forward minus friction, multiplied by the distance. This is gonna give us our total change in kinetic energy, which is what? What is kinetic energy? Not a trick. Oh, one half mv squared. One half m, which in this case is two kilograms, multiplied by v squared. And so unlike yesterday where we had to do some rationale and then we had to do some kinetic energy, if you know how to read your pieces and feed them to this, we can get v squared entirely using our graphing calculator. So all I'm going to do from here is I'm going to take these digits on the left and I'm going to chunk them together so that they're one number. Uh, so it's going to be 7 cosine 30 minus uh, 0 0.01 uh, parentheses, 2 times 9.81 plus 7 sine 30. Uh, close the parentheses on the sine, close the parentheses on the multiply, close the parentheses on the lead digit, which is 7. And now it'll be, that's all of this entered. I'm going to multiply that stuff by 5, and I'm going to hit enter. So on the left-hand side, our total amount of work is 29.15 joules. Now let's go ahead and look at what's going on over here on the right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is one half times two. What's that? One half times two is? One. That's just one. So technically I should divide by one to bring that over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Of course, that doesn't change our answer. And then what am I going to do to get V alone? Square root. Square root, and then I'll hit second answer. So it just automatically is entering the digit from the previous line. And we get the exact same answer. Oh, you know what? I think yesterday I might have used 10 instead of 9.81. Um, I might have been lazy. Yeah, I think it's because I used 10 instead of 9.81. But the important part is that we get effectively the same answer that we got by our uh, much longer, much more involved approach. If you ever see a place where you think conservation of energy will apply and you're like, hey, conservation of energy works. Or I could find the forces and do the kinematics. Which one should you do? Whichever one is more comfortable to you. It does not matter. They will always give the same answer. The only thing that conservation of energy does not tell us is it doesn't give us good information about time evolution. So yesterday I was able to say, hey, here's a kinematic equation. And I could use this to graph out how this thing is going to move over time. Energy won't tell you that. It will only tell you the final state. And if that's all you're interested in, this works great. Are there any questions on warm-up item one? No? Okay. Warm-up item two. Uh, a small bullet with a mass of lowercase m and velocity v embeds in a block of mass m, and then that goes towards a parabolic type ramp here. Um, now, I guess I should have said this at the top, but there's no friction here, which is just, you know, it's going to make our calculations just that much easier. And what we're solving for is we want to solve for h in terms of the other variables which are presented here. And we kind of laid out a way to do that. 
So number one, we are going to first have this do an inelastic collision. So for question number two here, we're gonna start off by writing and saying, well, if the momentum is conserved, well, then that's going to allow me to figure out the final velocity of the system after the collision. So P conserved. And uh, what is momentum? What is P? Well, mass times velocity. Momentum is defined as being mass times velocity. And again, uh, you can show that this quantity is conserved using Newton's third law. Uh, and so that is to say that mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet, plus mass of the block, velocity of the block, is going to be equal to, and in the case of this inelastic collision, since they're going to collide and they're going to become one thing, that new thing is gonna have the total mass of the two objects separately. So that's going to be equal to lowercase m plus capital M, then multiplied by whatever this final velocity is that we're solving for, uh, which I'll call V sub F, some final velocity. Now, uh, what is one, number one, there's a mistake here. There's actually something wrong about this. And it's kind of, uh, maybe it's a little esoteric. It's a little on the subtle side. What is wrong about this equation the way that I wrote it? Kind of a concept question about what momentum is. Is momentum a scalar or a vector? Vector. This equation right here, does this represent a scalar or a vector? It's a scalar because there's no x of a direction. This is a scalar because there's no indicator of direction, of mass and velocity. Which one of these two is a vector? Velocity. Velocity is a vector. So this is to say that velocity is determining the vector direction of momentum. Whatever way an object is moving, that is the same direction that its momentum vector points. Also, from our setup, one of these numbers is zero. I said that the block would start off at an initial velocity of zero. It has no momentum, so this is zero. And so all of the momentum of the system is going to be whatever the momentum of that bullet was before the collision. And so we're going to solve here for V sub F. So the final velocity of the two block system is just going to be equal to the mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet before the collision then divided by the total mass of the new system. So based on this information, is the total velocity of the system after the collision, is this faster or slower than it was before? Slower. Slower, and it better be both conceptually, right? Like if you shoot a Nerf dart at a toy, that toy is not going to go flying away faster than the Nerf dart that hit it itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's borne out in the math because m divided by m plus a number this right here always has to be less than one, so this will always scale the velocity down according to how big that block is. So this is the velocity that this thing will have. Now we have to do the energy part in order to figure out how high it's gonna go up this parabolic ramp. And now the reason why I'm choosing a parabolic ramp is what? Why would I choose a parabolic ramp in this question? And this is a thing that you should look out for on the actual AP test as well. If you see a ramp that's some funky shape, it's because of how they want you to approach the question. Think about it this way. Like, so here's my linear ramp, and then here's a ramp of a goofy proportion. What do we know about uh, blocks on ramps? We have to use trig to figure them out. Yeah, 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 no, that's exactly what I'm getting at. So if I put a thing here, then there are two components that we know about it. Mm -hmm. If this is theta, how much of its weight acts down the ramp and how much of its weight acts into the ramp? How much acts down, sine or cosine? Um, so the amount of weight acting down the ramp is mg sine theta, and the amount acting into the ramp is mg cosine theta. And because you can clearly define the forces on this ramp, you can use uh, Newton's laws here. This works. What about the second ramp? Can't really use trig. You cannot use trig on it because it is not a triangle. 
you could come up, if you had higher end math, you could come up with a function that describes how the forces act on this surface. You would actually need to know the equation that generates the surface. And then to get a tangent line, you'd have to take a derivative. This is a use of calculus right here. However, the reason why uh, we talk about ramps like this is so that um, the components of force are not easy to generate. In order to generate the components of force, you would have to use calculus. But one thing that these have in common is that if I have a block of mass m here, and if I have a block of mass m here, and we're going to raise it up to a height h, and we're going to raise it up to a height h, guess what is the same about both of these systems? The height. <laughs> that is straightforward, but guess what is a, the same requirement in both of these systems? The energy to reach the top? For both of them, U is going to be equal to MGH because potential energy stored by gravity is independent of pathway. So if you reverse engineer that logic kind of with a little bit of game theory, you're like, okay, I literally can't answer this using Newton's laws. So therefore, every time you see a ramp with some weird shape, they're like, hey, it's a semicircle or it's a parabola or a curved ramp, da 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 you must use conservation of energy in order to say something useful about it. Um, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now in item number two, we're gonna use conservation of energy in order to figure out the maximum height that it can go to in this case. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm gonna write out the very most formal definition of conservation of energy that we um, almost never, fully right out. We kind of jump to the conclusion. Please keep in mind that what conservation of energy is actually saying is that mechanical energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. And what we're saying here right at the top is that at the bottom of the ramp, right, once it's this two object system starts moving up, so this would be the big M, uh, sorry, the little m Im embedded in the big M, and now it's moving upwards. We're saying that all of the energy available in the system, 100% of it, is in the form of kinetic energy at that exact moment. So when it's at the bottom here, right, the mechanical energy, because we're at a height of zero, it is equal to kinetic energy plus, well, zero when it's at the bottom. And then at the top, when it meets, reaches its maximum height, how fast is it going? When you, throw a, right, when you throw a ball up, it reaches its maximum height when the velocity is zero, because when it changes direction, that velocity vector has got to flip over. And as it flips over, it has to cross through zero in the middle. And so at the very top, so this is a mechanical energy at the bottom, mechanical energy at the top, is gonna be equal to, well, it's not moving when it reaches its max height, it's switching direction, plus the potential energy. And the definition of the conservation of energy is that without external forces, without outside forces that can somehow drive the motion, this number up front, Me, this is the thing which is constant. So when you are saying, hey, the kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy, you're actually making a huge, huge statement you're setting up two energy equations and setting them equal. It's just that we do it so often in our solution procedures, we forget that like this is where that's actually coming from. So the initial kinetic energy it has is gonna be equal to the potential energy that it has when it's at the top. And now we can plug in some terms and solve. So kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. One half, and it's gonna be the combined mass of our bullet embedded in a wooden block system mass of the bullet plus mass of the block, then multiplied by V squared, uh, which we solved for, right? We solved for V in the first step when we did our collision. So it's gonna be that velocity, uh, mass of the bullet, initial velocity of the bullet, divided by mass plus mass squared. So this is just kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And this is going to be equal to potential energy, which is 
for gravity, mgh, m plus m times g times the maximum height that it will then reach. Uh, what can I cancel out of both sides? M plus m. m plus m. They have a common mass, so both of these will go away. And now to get h alone, all I have to do is divide both sides by g. So the maximum height that this collided bullet block system will be able to reach is going to be equal to 1 over 2g multiplied by the mass of the bullet, initial velocity of the bullet, divided by the combined mass, all then squared. Or whatever way you want to calculate this out. This is just a slightly different version of the ballistic pendulum question that we looked at in an example a long, long time ago. Are there any questions on items one or two today? Yeah, Mr. O, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So this was an, an elastic collision. Doesn't that mean that kinetic or energy is not a conserved quantity? Or? That is an excellent question, and it is not conserved. So energy is lost. However, the question is, where is that energy lost? So that's why I started off by breaking this up into two events. And so in the act of the elastic collision at the moment that this block hits this block, right here in the uh, inelastic collision itself, at that very moment, energy is lost. Oh, okay. And you could show it by showing that one half mv squared of just the bullet is actually provably a bigger number than the one half mv squared written right here. So this is less energy than the bullet had because when it collided with it, a little bit of energy was lost. However, after they become one object and it's just one object moving through space on its own, having some sort of kinetic energy and brushing up against this ramp, it's working against a conservative force. The only thing it's working against is gravity. And so from that moment forward, energy is conserved. So energy is lost here, but after the collision, as we evolve forward in time, energy is conserved from that point forward. Oh, all right, thank you. Yep, that's an excellent question, yeah. So energy is lost in the elastic collision, but the interaction with the ramp itself is a conservative interaction. All right. Robinson. Yes? There's no like pendulums on the test, right? The AP there test. are pendulums on the test. Oh, there are? Okay. There are, yeah. And, uh huh? I thought they took that out. But okay. <laughs> no, so okay. what they took out are waves and oscillations. Oh, so okay. they can absolutely ask about simple harmonic oscillators, okay. but we were going to get to a point where we were talking about sound as a physical wave, or like if I have water and I put a bobber in it and I drive that bobber up and down, how does the water waves ripple out across the surface of the water? Mm -hmm. That is the wave stuff that was removed. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions on today's two parts of the warm up? Otherwise, I have just a couple like quick hits I want to give on conservation of energy, uh, conservation of momentum type questions. Just good advice to look out for. Okay. And then I think we might end a little bit early today. So if you still need to get done with that first free response, you'll have a little bit of extra time today to do that. Um, cause yesterday we talked about all of the conservation laws that we needed to, we'll look at, you know, more details as we do tutorials for the rest of the week. Uh, but just some quick pro tips. <clears throat> uh, please remember that, um, when it comes to work, work is equal to force parallel multiplied then by displacement. Um, work itself is not a vector. It's a scalar because, uh, it's a change in energy. And energy is not a vector, change in kinetic energy. That is to say that force itself is a vector and uh, displacement itself is a vector. And when you multiply a vector by a vector, that then produces back a scalar. Um, if force parallel and, uh, I'm sorry, if force and If force and displacement are not parallel, uh, you need to do trig.
And I don't really like that they do this because in reality, your angle could be freaking anywhere, right? It could be anywhere facing any direction, any of that stuff. But on the AP test, uh, they were so wild as to say, right here, the change in energy of a system is equal to work, is equal to force parallel multiplied by distance, is equal to FD cosine theta. This isn't true in the real world or in college or whatever, but on the AP test, if they're asking you to do trig in order to figure out which component of force does work, they are gonna set the problem up so that it is the cosine component. Uh, so this is to say that on the AP test, if they're not parallel for, sorry, work is gonna be equal to FD multiplied by the cosine of the angle in between them. It will always be set up that way. Uh, and of course, this has units of joules. However, if you have uh, that you are applying a force perpendicular to your displacement, that's what we call a torque, right? So if you look at these two equations on here, here's work, Fd cosine theta, but the torque equation right here is Rf sine theta. So if this is the object that you're talking about, Fd cosine theta is gonna give you the parallel component, whereas Fd sine theta is going to give you the perpendicular component. It's a really weird thought, but even though mathematically these should both return the same units, this is Newtons times meters times something unitless. When it comes to Newton meters and talking about energy, that has units of a joule. However, when it comes to talking about torque, force times distance, and then something which is still unitless, it should be the same units. It should be Newton meters. Uh, torque is not measured in joules. Torque is only measured out in Newtons multiplied by meters. So uh, despite the fact. So they're both Newton times meter? Uh, kind of? <laughs> no. <laughs> so despite work and torque having the same uh, internal units, When we talk about work, work is equal to one Newton times one meter, which we can say is equal to one joule. But when it comes to the unit of torque, torque is equal to one Newton times a meter, but this is not equal to a joule. You cannot talk about joules when it comes to torque. They do different things. Work is the capacity to move an object or change its velocity. Torque is describing the ability to rotate an object based on where a force is applied. It has no talk of capacity. So you could use the amount of energy in a system to determine the final velocity of an object. You can't get any sorts of final statements from torques. Being given a torque is very similar to being given a force. You need to know how far it's applied or for how much time it's applied in order to give data about final states. And of course, next week we'll be talking about rotation. Um, those are just some like quick tips I wanted y'all to work out for or look out for. But for the most part, conservation of energy is straightforward. We are looking for places where energy is transforming from one type to another. Energy is only transformed according to conservation of energy if it is a conservative force, which I again try to think of more examples. I couldn't. I'm pretty sure the only conservative forces that y'all have to deal with are gravity. So if an object is being lifted up or falling down, that is some sort of conservation of energy eligible statement. And the other place where energy is conserved uh, is springs. Springs have an associated potential energy storage of one half kx squared. That's why when I click my pen together, I'm doing a work. I have to apply a force over a distance to click this pen. But the act of doing that compresses a spring inside of it. I actually think the inside spring is in here. So that when I uh, let it go, it just pops back open on its own it is suddenly releasing all of that stored potential energy back as kinetic energy when it accelerates out this top half of the pen. Kinetic en or potential energy, kinetic energy. Uh, yeah. And then in terms of momentum, please remember that uh, an object exploding apart, so explosions are collisions. And I've only ever seen this once in all of my time doing AP tests. I think it was like 2013, where they had two objects that were suddenly pushed apart. 
these are still collisions, even though they are like a collision being played in reverse. So if I had uh, something like this, okay, where I have like one thing inside of another, right? And then in between them, we place charge so that when it explodes, we get pop, and now these two pieces are gonna come apart, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and call the big crescent thing C. That's gonna be C. And then the little ball thing, B, right? Let's go ahead and talk real quick about what the conservation of momentum statement is going to look like here. Um, right now, we'll say that the whole system has a velocity of zero. So how much momentum does this total system have? Zero. Zero. So the momentum before this thing explodes is going to be equal to the momentum after this thing explodes. And what we just found out is that before it had zero momentum which means that afterwards we are also going to have zero momentum. Mm -hmm. That's because ball B is going to be shot out to the right with some velocity B, and ball or object C, the crescent-shaped part, is going to be shot to the left with some velocity C. So they had zero momentum before. They're going to have zero momentum after, but afterwards there's two objects. There's an object with mass C moving with velocity C, and there's an object with mass B moving with velocity B. So what does it mean if two things add up to zero? And this is a trick that you should get used to. This is going to be everywhere in math and science for the next four years. Very clever to find things that add up to zero because that tells us what about them. They're equal. Equal and? Opposite. Excellent. If two things add up to zero, this is one of the most powerful features of any conservation equation. Whenever you talk about conservation laws, the first place your brain should go is like, haha, this guy is going to set something equal to zero just to show that these two things are equal and opposite. That's why we do conservation of mass and chemistry. So you could be like, hey, I have a missing element. If I have these other values, I can calculate how much mass that missing element had. But nonetheless, this tells us that negative MCVC is going to be equal to MB. VB. So assuming that the size here represents the relative velocity, which one of these is going to be the fast one? Uh, the smaller one. The smaller one, right? This is saying that the products are equal, the velocity carries the um, direction, so they're moving in opposite directions, that tracks with how explosions work, and if mass B is small, if that's the small piece coming off of this explosion, then velocity B will have to be big. And if mass C is big, that means velocity C will have to be small and vice versa. This very elegant equation kind of captures our conceptual understanding of how the bits and pieces of an, ex of an explosion go flying off. Now, of course, this is only two pieces to this explosion. So this is like a rocket and it's rocket fuel or a physics teacher and a medicine ball. But this is still a type of collision, even though no two objects are crashing together. It's the same idea, but playing the video in reverse. I'll say that one more time. It's the same idea as two objects hitting and sticking, except that is playing in reverse. Okay. Um, past that, we already have beaten to death the fact that an inelastic collision involves one equation, just momentum, but an elastic collision involves two equations. Why? Elastic collisions can serve two things. Energy and momentum energy and momentum, you write up both of those conservation statements and do a little bit of substitution to solve it. I have never seen on an AP test in the modern era uh, a question where they actually expect you to do that calculation start to finish. They asked that of me, or the year before me, I think in 2006, back when it was the old AP test, but the calculation is tedious, so I don't think it can come up, not really. Here's a couple other um, important concepts to keep in mind uh just like i said this whole thing is just tips tips me trying to guess what's going to be on that test um what is a momentum change for an object that bounces off of a wall or a surface and comes back with the same velocity so here's m here's v this thing bounces back with the same velocity so what is the change in momentum for uh dribbling a basketball for example right bounce a ball off the ground, it comes back up to the same height. It's two times. 
Why? Why is it two times the momentum? Because it has to overcome the impact and then the change in direction. Very good. So momentum is going to be, well, change in anything is always going to be what that thing is later minus what that thing was before. And so its final velocity is going to be this V. And I'm going to say that moving to the left is negative, negative and positive, right? So this is going to be equal to negative MV minus what it was before. But up here, it was moving to the right, which is positive. So it'll be negative MV minus MV. So the total change in momentum here is going to be equal to 2MV. In general, if an object bounces off of something rigid and then comes back, the total momentum change is double what the original momentum was. You need one set of the momentum to bring this guy to rest, and then you need another set of momentum to send him packing in the other direction. Um, and here's a weirder question. How is it that momentum is conserved in this case then? Where is this 2MV coming from? And this is a weirder thought. I don't expect any of y'all to get this right, but it's a weird question. It's a good concept question to try and think about inside of your brain. Where does this 2MV come from? Let's say we're playing racquetball. What do you bounce a racquetball off of? A racket. Um, <laughs> sure, or squash ball or handball or whatever. You, you hit it and then the ball hits what? The wall. It hits a wall, right? And that wall is uh, part of a building and that building is connected to the... Ground. The ground. <laughs> okay. It's in the foundation of the building and that foundation of the building is embedded in the earth. The mm -hmm. reason why this is possible is that when you bounce this thing off of the wall, and this is ignoring the material properties of the wall or whatever, it might be springy, which will change the correctness of what I'm about to say, but where this 2MB is coming from is it's basically coming from the reservoir of the earth. So the same way how we're like, well, if I pull the earth up with 75 newtons of force, I'm sorry, 750 newtons of force, the earth pulls, or I pull the earth up with that same amount, it's just that the earth's mass is so big that it doesn't notice. This 2MV of momentum that is being used to reverse the wall is coming from the wall itself which technically to be conserved, you are going to change the momentum of the wall, which will change the momentum of the foundation, which will change the momentum of the earth. But if you change the momentum of the earth by two MV, where M is the mass of a racquetball, yo, the earth isn't gonna notice. You're not gonna throw the earth's orbit way off just by slightly affecting its momentum. So momentum is conserved in literally all interactions everywhere forever. It's just that when you like dribble a basketball on the ground, the thing receiving the impact on the other side is the earth, and it really does not notice that you are impacting its momentum. It just has too big of a mass for us to observe that change in velocity. Uh, anyway, just some hot pro tips. Tonight, wrap up free response four, which is about uh, some light conservation of energy calculations. And when we come in tomorrow, uh, we'll do a tutorial of that question start to finish. And then maybe we finish it, maybe we don't. Uh, hopefully we do. If we don't, we'll finish it on Thursday. And then on Friday, we'll do the tutorial for free response five. Um, are there any questions on that stuff or what we're doing for the rest of this week? No? no? Okay. Um, Y'all have a nice day. And like I said, if you haven't already done so, wrap up the free response unit four. And if you do that, then you know feel free to chill, work on your other classes, or maybe get a move on to free response five. And if you get done with that, you're basically done with the take home part of the work for this week. All right. Okay. Take it easy. Thank you. All right. See you, Sarah. Okay.